Happy New Year again to all of you that have come in since we said that earlier. And we are blessed to have you here. I don't know what New Year's resolutions you have made. One I have made is to uh, do 1 Corinthians 13 better in my life. You know 1 Corinthians 13? Do we have the words up there? Who's in charge up there? Can we go to the next? Do we have the text? Would you stand with me? We're going to do this for the next several weeks and read 1 Corinthians 13. Again, would you stand where you are and uh, let these words soak into your mind. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For they know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. When the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. And the greatest of these is love. Amen. Be seated. I got a phone call this week. And next Saturday night, I have to go up to one of my old churches in southern Oregon and do a funeral. He was one of my youth. And he died at 52. So what does that tell you about me? My youth are now in their 50s. How could that be? Died of cancer. These are people that I was very, very close to. And uh, when they found out, maybe I could sneak away and get up there. So I'm going to fly out Saturday night and get up there and do a funeral on Sunday. Little small country church, my first church after seminary. And it just began to bring back memories. And I, I began to be on the phone with these people and remembering stuff that I went through. Some of you, you've heard. I had an evangelist come into my church. He went to uh, eat dinner, Sabbath dinner at this lady's home. I understand she's still alive, still as angry and yelling at the world as she was 35 years ago. And she had a picture window looking out over her 40 acres. The evangelist is eating there. When she looked out the window and she saw a real estate man selling her property on Sabbath. She went to the kitchen, grabbed a pot and a pan. She went out into the field and began to beat on the pot and pan until she got his attention. He finally looked up and she said, I told you this was God's holy Sabbath day. You were not to sell my place on the Sabbath. Get off my property. This is God's Sabbath. Banging the pot and pan. The evangelist told me he wanted to crawl under the table. And the worst part of the story is one of my members knew that real estate person. He told her the story. And he said, I'm an Adventist. I went to Walla Walla. I was thinking of coming back to the church until that happened. stories my six years I tell my kids about a man that I used to visit would come to church named mushroom wasn't his real name genius PhD 
but had fried some of his brain with drugs, lived on this organic farm back before that was famous. He and his girlfriend and little girl lived in a cave. And I'd go out and visit them, give Bible studies to them, <laughs> came to church. They would bring food to the potluck. Nobody wanted to eat food from them. And so the whisper would go, watch out for that one. Don't eat that one. And all the other plates would be empty except the one that they brought would be full of food still. Mushroom. He hadn't washed his hair in seven years. It hung like rope from his head. They called him Mushroom. But I baptized hundred some people there, my years there. We had baptisms in creeks. We had baptisms in jacuzzis. We had special moments. They want us to bring my guitar and we will all get up. I used to play the guitar and we would lead songs for 15 minutes in church. And they want to do that again in the funeral. I'll preach in the same little church again. It was a small enough church that after church someone could say, hey, let's go up to the dam. And half the church would go up to the dam and we would sit there and have worship and eat potluck and just make up a day on the spot. Unbelievable, holy and sacred moments and friends I have 30 years later. And they said, Pastor Dan, could you come up? We'll all get together. We'll pick you up at the airport. Special, special time. On the other hand, there were some other things. I baptized a big 300-pound football player. He lasted a month before they drove him out. I baptized another lady who wore a sleeveless dress the next week to church. They drove her out. I baptized one whole family. Someone visited them and heard the dryer going on Sabbath, and they said, Pastor Dan, what did you miss? Drove that family out of the church. I won a lady who became our church organist, the only lady who could play the organ. She wore a wedding ring. They drove her and her husband out of the church. Why does it have to be like this? Why does it have to be a mix? Why can't it just be only love and only magical moments of people who just love potlucks and vespers and, and baptisms? Love, 1 Corinthians 13. My brother worked for the Adventist Media Center for 20 years. He was a script writer. Did you know that those people write scripts for the speakers? <laughs> Every word they speak, someone else wrote. They're too busy. For 20 years, and then he said one thing he should not have said, and they asked him to leave. He called me up. He said, Dan, I have two hours to choose between being fired or volunteering to resign, and if I resign, they'll give me this lump sum, huge amount of money. He decided to resign. The vice president from the media center come up and stood there in the office while my brother had to box up his stuff and walk out to be sure that he didn't take anything that was not of his. And my brother had a hard time with the president of that media ministry. Most of you would know his name. For years, just festered this thing. Finally knew he had to get over it. He, my brother was a pastor. Finally wrote a letter to make it all right. And the president of that media program wrote back, and they all got it worked out. But what if my brother had died or Jesus had come before he wrote that letter? If my brother had loved every single person in the world except one, would he be saved? Or do you have to love everybody? When we say grace, everyone, everywhere, every time, does that God's grace or does it have to be our grace too? How far does this 1 Corinthians 13 thing have to go? So it's my New Year's resolution. 1 Corinthians 13. May it be part of me, part of us. May we be known as a church of 1 Corinthians 13. Amen? And we have evangelism here in a few weeks. When people come to check out our church, may it not just be our truth or our doctrines or our food or our potluck or our beautiful buildings. May it be the smell of love that just goes out from this church, 1 Corinthians 13. Why not? If you have your Bible with you, I invite you to just go back to the chapter. And we will very quickly go through 
these first two or three verses, 1 Corinthians 13. And Paul just is going to give sort of like an electric shock treatment. These are, this is like a code in the hospital where they code somebody and you come with the electric shock and you wake people up. And Paul is going to wake people up. He says, you have no idea how important love is to God. And God wants love to be at the very highest of all the values. And so he says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. We are not a big tongue-speaking church. <laughs> there are a few Adventists today who do speak in tongues, but not many. I've had Adventists lay their hands on me and try to get me to speak in tongues, but <laughs> so far has not, not clicked in. But Paul says here about all those people who have these sort of magical things. They can speak in tongues. I've also been to the Advent to uh, services where they have holy laughter or holy barking or holy hopping. I've been to there where they have slain in the spirit. I've been there where they had healings. I've been there where they were walking drunk in the spirit. And they believe those are signs that you are spiritually mature. And Paul says, even if you had all of that, even if you're the most spiritual people in the church, if you're the ones always speaking for God, you are the, you are the ones the whole church recognizes as the spiritually powerful people, that is nothing. All that just sounds like the church's fire alarm, Bill Heibel says, or the sound system when it's not working right in the ears of God. I don't know what to do with this. Shall I change? What can I do to make this better? Something is not right. Anyway, he says, nothing matters. If you speak in tongues like this, if you speak in tongues like this, and you don't have love, God doesn't just care what you are in your spiritual maturity. He wants to know when you walk home exhausted, how do you treat the people in your house? How do you deal with the cashier at the store? How do you deal with the waitress in the restaurant? How do you deal with the guy who cuts in front of you on the freeway Pastor Garrett was talking about? Is it love? Verse 2. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, but have not love, then I am nothing. Nothing. I thought of a story. I have two professors that are friends of mine. Recognize this, Garrett? You know this person. Two professors on opposite ends of the theological continuum in the Adventist church. One's liberal, progressive, one is conservative. Great friends of mine, both in their middle 60s, late 60s now. The Adventists had one theological society, but the conservatives got mad because they didn't feel like they could get their voice heard, they could not get their papers in, and so they started a new society 25 years ago. Often meet in exactly the same city, five, ten miles apart. This year was in Chicago. One group meets, then the other group meets at the same time in the same city. And these two people were at the beginning of that. Twenty years later, I know that they were coming together in their theological views. I had lunch with both of them, and I took it upon myself to bring the two of them together. And I called the one who wrote these books, and I said, it's been 25 years. I think you guys are closer theologically than you think. Why don't you give them a call? Why don't you just give them a call and see if you can't narrow down that last 5%. And this man, who has a wonderful picture of God, has a monthly column in one of our Adventist journals, is a wonderful human being, said to me on the phone, Pastor Dan, I just can't. He said, Dan, I was sitting there in the audience when he took my book and ripped it page by page. I just can't. And the Bible says, if you have the gift of prophecy, if you have the gift of knowledge, you have all these words, but you don't have love. You have nothing. Can you take these books? You have nothing. 
You can be the one who has their hand up in the Sabbath school class. You can be the one that always seems to have the right answers. You can be the one that can chart the 2300 days of the millennial chart. You know what pre-tribulation and post-tribulation mean. You've got knowledge, but not love. God says, it's nothing, nothing. And I had quite an experience as a young pastor. I came out of school, 25 years old, out of seminary, walked into this little church that I'm going to go speak in next week, next Saturday, next Sunday. And I thought I was God's gift to this church. I had a degree, I had education. There were only three people in that whole church that had ever been to college. There's only a couple of people who were working. Most people are unemployed or on, on some sort of uh, benefit somewhere, retired. I thought, boy, I will. I had all this education stored up and I was going to give it to these people. Work hard, baptized a lot of people, church grew. I was sitting at a dinner with a group of people three years in, and one of them said some nice things to me, and they said, Dan, Pastor Dan, we finally feel like you were really one of us, that you really love us. I said, what are you, what are you talking about? I've been in all your homes. I love you. I got a good GPA when I was in school. I was considered one of the top students academically. But somehow when I got out to this little church, no one seemed to want me to tell them about my GPA. They did not need to know the theological classes or the big words that I knew. What were they measuring? That I loved them or not. They wanted to know 1 Corinthians 13. And Paul says, if you could have all these words and knowledge, but you don't have love, it counts for nothing. And then he says, and if I have a faith, that can move mountains, but do not have love, then it is nothing. Faith that can move mountains. I don't know how many of you can move mountains, but we all have people who know how to get things done. They know how to get it done. You can put on a dinner. They can put on a program. You need something to be fixed, they can do it. They are capable, and they do great work, and they go on mission trips, and they they, they can move mountains. They have big picture. They can make the church go. We need faith people. But he says, even if you can get all this done, if you are capable and you can move mountains and make things happen, it counts for nothing if you don't have love. And then finally in verse 3, if I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. We'll put these two together. Most of us are not going to have to be martyrs, probably. But if you take this verse to think, all of us who give, we give lots of tithes and offerings this last month at the end of the year. There are those, some who gave a lot. Others of us gave what we could, the best we could. We have people who volunteer a lot for this church. We have people who were there in the kitchen after potluck for hours cleaning up what Earl and some of these people did to clean up that kitchen for the banquet a couple weeks ago. We have people down here fixing pews and making church go. We have people running Sabbath schools, people who volunteer, Pathfinder leaders. We have people who are going to go on a mission trip. And he said, you could do all of that. You could be singing in the praise team. You could play three instruments for God. You could be doing all of these things for God. It counts for nothing if it's not done with love and you don't have love. I, we sent a group down to Mexico to do a mission trip. Pathfinder leader went along. He was the building coordinator, the foreman. I wasn't able to go on that trip. My youth pastor went. They all came back. <laughs> and they said to me, Pastor Dan, our Pathfinder leader got mad at one of the kids because he wasn't working hard. Hit him in the face. I said, our Pathfinder leader hit him in the face? The father of the kid called me. He said, Pastor Dan, do you know what this guy did? Hit my kid in the face. He's on a mission trip trying to get work done, wants to get the project done for the glory of God. Kid's not working. Hits him in the face. 
Paul says, if I, if I give all to the poor, and I give my life to but don't love, it counts for nothing. I had a couple tell me one time they were going through a tough time. They went to a counselor and the counselor said, you can either be right or you can be married. <laughs> you can either be right. Are you looking at each other now? <laughs> no, don't do that. Don't do that. Is love the dominant factor in your life? Or is love down the list somewhere? Being right is more important. Or doing something. Or doing this for God. No, it's just love. The greatest of these is love. And here's my question today. Is it possible for an organization, a family, a marriage to be characterized by love? Is it possible, to, for, the, is it possible for a whole culture to be permeated with love? You know what they call near-death experiences. I've had church members tell me they were in the hospital, they had surgery, some brain damage, something happened. And they say, Pastor Dan, I went to heaven. So what do you mean you went to heaven? Oh, I went to heaven. I was there in the bed. All of a sudden, I began to rise out of the bed. I could see myself, and they took me through the clouds. All of a sudden, I was at the gates of heaven. I saw all the light. I saw all the glory. And I could feel this love coming from God. And then all of a sudden, I was back down here. Is that when it's going to be? We believe that we will walk in the gates of heaven. We will feel love like we've never felt before. We will feel the love that you and I have been looking for, longing for, searching for all our lives. We will finally find it in God himself when we walk into the gates of heaven. We believe that no one will ever feel inferior again. We will never feel insecure. We will never feel like we're somehow incomplete. God's love will heal all of that once and for all. The moment we walk through the gates... You will never feel embarrassed. That's why it says in Revelation 21, there will be no more tears, no more crying, no more sorrow, no more death. Because we will be healed by the love of God. Can it be here? Is there a way somehow that culture can actually be here with human people? What does Paul mean when he says, I want you to have 1 Corinthians 13 in your church? There's a famous story from Thailand. Where I grew up, I've been to this place called the Bridge of the River Kwai. Some of you have seen the movie. The World War II, the American and the British prisoners were building a bridge. And in building the bridge, they were terrible to these people. And there was just chaos in these camps. People were evil. They were being treated evil. And they treated each other evil. It was terrible. One day, the Japanese lined everyone up after work. They had counted the shovels, and one shovel was missing, and they said, somebody has stolen a shovel. You better admit it, or all will die. No one moved. No one moved. Finally, the guy who went crazy, the Japanese command, and he says, I'll die. All of a sudden, one man stepped forward and says, I took it. I was the one. The guy got so mad, took a shovel, clubbed him down under the ground, beat him on his head until he killed the man right there in front of everybody. The prisoners took him, buried him back in their place. Then they counted the shovels, and there were no shovels missing. He had not taken a shovel. But rather than have the whole camp be killed, he has stepped forward and took it on himself. That story spread like wildfire all the way through the camp. And somehow a place where they were fighting and hurting and doing terrible, stealing from each other, began to be a different place because one man made an act of love. I've listened to Fred Craddock, one of the great preachers and preaching, teaching preachers. I've had him come preach in my church. When he retired, he went back to the Appalachian Mountains, still as visiting young pastors. I've heard him tell a story when he was the brand new pastor right out of school, pastoring a little church in the Appalachian Mountains. And he finally had a few people ready for baptism, and they went down to a river, cold. So they had a big fire, and they had blankets. As soon as they'd come out of the water, they'd wrap a blanket around them. And then they had a potluck and a potato salad and all the usual things. Then they would put all the new members and sit them in a circle around the fire. And all the older church members would stand around them. And one would say, you know, my name is so-and-so. And if you ever need someone to just chop wood for you, I will be the one. 
The next one would say, I'm so-and-so. If you ever need someone to watch your kids while you go to the market, I'll be the one. The next one, I'm so-and-so. If you ever need someone to do some ironing, if you ever need someone to take you to the doctor, if you ever need, and they would go around the whole circle offering to be there for the new members. And finally it would be done, and people just knew it was time to go. He said, I never knew exactly how they knew. They just knew. And then someone would begin to take the plane. They would go away. And then he said, it would be just me and this old elder, new pastor. And this old, old elder would kick the final sand on the fire, and he would say, Craddock, people don't get no closer than that. Is it possible for there to be a culture of love that is permeated with 1 Corinthians 13? Yes or no? I was listening to the radio this week. They were talking about Peyton Manning. Do you know who Peyton Manning is? The quarterback for Denver now. Most valuable player, what, four times? Going to be Hall of Fame. Had four neck surgeries. They let him go from Indiana. He went to Denver. People said, can he ever play again? 37 years old. And he's up for MVP again this year. He's won, like, what, 12 games in a row. He's in the playoffs. And they said this. Peyton Manning makes everyone better on that team by 15%. Why? Because they now have Peyton Manning on their team. They will not be the one that will somehow disappoint Peyton Manning. He just puts out this, this is what we are going to do. And they will not be the one that will disappoint Peyton Manning. And so they're all 15% better. If they will do that for Peyton Manning, how should you and I do for Jesus Christ who died on a cross? We believe that Jesus is the greatest picture of God this world has ever seen. And we believe that the cross that we celebrate today is the greatest picture of love that the history of the world has ever seen. Shouldn't that make a difference that we should be 1 Corinthians 13? Yes? I thank you for what the drama did today. The moment they come home, the past is gone. The past doesn't matter anymore. That's what love is. We have a new year. The past is gone. We don't hold any of the past against anybody, not against your kids, not against anybody. That's done. And we start over again with grace. And to say, I will love you, doesn't matter anything that we've heard back before. It's done. That's the cross. Pastor Garrett lost his computer last, what, two weeks ago? And iPad in a briefcase pack. Called all of us. Has anybody seen it? We called all the other churches that rent from us. He turned it into everywhere, police everywhere. Finally, this week, he authorized, the older said, okay, get another computer. All his sermons gone, all his stories. Called me last night. I knew. I just knew. <laughs> Why would Garrett call me at 10 o'clock Friday night? I got on the phone and said, you got the computer, didn't you? I just said that right off the bat. I knew. And Garrett said, guy walked in, one of our renters, saw it outside Garrett's locked office. Garrett had left, left it sitting there, forgot it. Thought he would help save Garrett, took it home. And kept it in his car for two weeks. Did not call Salvino. Did not come to the church. Did not bring it back to us. Let Garrett sit, scared to death, for two weeks. And I don't know if Garrett said this or he just thought it. But he thought, you had my life in your hands. And you drove around for two weeks. <laughs> and I just want to say, each of us has people in our hands. What do you do with their heart, the way we talk, the way we relate? We have people in our hand, their lives in our hands. 1 Corinthians 13, amen? Can we do this? That's my vow for this year, for myself, all of us, to be the church. When we do evangelism here next month, it will not just be the truth of our doctrines. It will not just be we have this right. Not just because we have good buildings that we try to maintain. It'll be because people can just smell the love that is in this church. Amen? I tried to answer the question before I'm done. How? We've all vowed it. We all said, I will do better. I'm not going to say those things ever again. I'm not going to lose it with those people again. I'm not going to say that to my kids again. But then we do it. How do we get so filled with the love of God that it just, it just keeps us loving 1 Corinthians 13? My only illustration after this long staring at the wall is this, is music. There's just some music that gets inside of you. 
and you just cannot help but express it a little. My sons know this about me. Probably some of you have seen it too. Last year, they just watched me up in front. I'd sit up in front there. I've directed song service for so many years that when I hear a song and that I like, I just begin to, to direct it. It's not conscious. I don't mean to do it. I just do it. I'm in the car, and I'm directing music. I'm just... So my sons now, they know. So we're driving up to go skiing this week, and they get their iPad when I'm not watching, and they stick it in, and all of a sudden... The music begins to play. We have a few seconds. Do you have it up there? Is it ready to go? This is not Jesus song. I didn't have time to find a Jesus song, all right? A few seconds. Is it going to work? All my high technology. <laughs> it's not going to work. Do you understand my illustration? There is some music that is so alive. It's got so much rhythm. It gets inside of you. And all of a sudden, it just, you begin to tap your toe and you begin to make a motion. You just can't help it. And if you and I will just spend enough time with Jesus, there is this ocean of love that God has. And if you will just look at the cross and spend time with God, that love somehow comes inside and fills us up. And it just can't help but begin to show up in the people that we have in our lives. Amen? That's the gospel. This year, may it be so for each of us. My guitar people, where's my guitar people? Can you come up quickly and bring mine? Because I'm in this groove of going back to being a youth pastor again after 35 years, you realize that I was Garrett before Pastor Garrett was Pastor Garrett, all right? <laughs> there was a day. Maybe not as much hair, but close. <laughs> and we sang, that's no good. We sang every Sabbath, 10, 15 minutes, the old song. So we're going to take you back 30 or 40 years to we, they will know we are Christians by our love. Would you stand? And if you don't know this song, you should. Do we even know this song, Garrett? <laughs> Is it up here in the words? Where's our words? Not up there. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We will one in the Lord. And they'll know we are that when one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love. By our love, yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will work with each other. We will work hand in hand. We will work with each other. We will work hand in hand. And we'll learn each man's dignity and say, and they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Would you bow your heads for prayer as we finish this part before we go on to our communion. Our Father in heaven, we truly want that to be the way it is. We know someday we will walk through the gates of heaven and we will feel love. But we don't want people to have to have a near-death experience in order to have that happen. We want people to be able to come here, to be in our families, in our marriages, in our school, in our workplace. We want to be the most, 1 Corinthians 13, the most loving. Yes, the most truthful. Yes, we want to keep the commandments. Yes, the 28 fundamental beliefs. But over it all, we want this. We want to be known. For our love, which is your love, pass through us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.